Hey there, this is Ruben Lerner. Welcome to my talk, Function Dissection Lab, here at PyCon APAC 2022. I'm really excited to be here. Just a few words about myself. Um, I teach Python. I've had my own business since 1995. Just about every day, I work with companies around the world teaching Python. I do corporate training. I have video courses. I do hybrid courses. I've published several books on Python, both Python Workout and Pandas Workout. And I publish a newsletter, a free weekly newsletter about Python and software engineering called Better Developers Every Week, currently with about 25,000 subscribers. But enough about me. Let's write some code. So, and then we're going to take it apart. So let's consider this code. Let's say I say x equals 10, 20, 30, d equals a1, b2, c3, and def hello name return f hello name. So I've got a list, I've got a dictionary, and I've got a function. What does this look like behind the scenes? What's going on here? Well, one of the best ways that I've found to look at code is to use something called the Python Tutor. That's at pythontutor.com. It's an amazing, amazing site by Philip Guo and a few other people. And let's take a look at what happens when I pop this code into the Python Tutor. So we see that x is a list, d is a dictionary, and hello is a function. Notice, though, x, d, and hello are all variables. They're all global variables. Now, we know that when we assign 10, 20, 30 to x, we have a list and we're assigning to the global x. And we know that when we have a dict we're, and we assign it to d, well, we have a global variable d. But it's not always obvious that functions, when we define them, are variables also. And yet here we see they are. When you use def, you create a function object and then you assign it to a variable. And there are many languages in which you have separate namespaces, one for data and one for functions. That is not true in Python. In Python, we have one namespace that is shared by both variables and functions. So you cannot have a variable x and a function x in the same program. The last one that was defined is the one that currently has that value. And the thing is, because functions, even when we define them with def, or especially when we define them with def, because functions are objects, well, we can treat them as nouns, not just as verbs. And that's what we're going to do here during this talk. Functions, like all objects, can be assigned. So, for example, if I want to, I can say hello to equals hello. And now, hello to and hello, those are two variables referring to the same object, the same function object. Now, functions, like all objects, can be passed as arguments. So, I could say even something like hello and hello. Moreover, functions like all objects have attributes, those things that come after the dot. So I can find out what attributes a function has, just as I can find out what attributes any other object has by running the dir function on it. So all this is nice in theory, but what really is going on? And indeed, how does Python use a function's attributes? Well, let's take a look. If I say here def hello name, return f hello name, and I run hello world, Great, I get back the string hello world. This should not come as a surprise. But what if I just say hello? Right, what if I call the hello function without any arguments? You probably won't be surprised to know that I get an error message that this does not work. And unlike other fun other unlike many other languages, there's no way in Python to define hello with zero arguments, hello with one argument, hello with two arguments. And that's because when we define hello, we are assigning to the variable hello. And saying that we have hello with zero arguments, hello with one argument, hello with two arguments, that's like saying, I want to assign x equals 5, and then I want to assign x equals 7. Hey, why doesn't Python remember that x was once equal to 5? Obviously, the second assignment overwrote the first one. In the same way, the last, as I said before, the last function definition to a name is what we get here. So when I say hello without any arguments here, we're trying to call the function hello that I just defined that takes one argument that requires one argument. And it says, indeed, hello is missing one required positional argument, name. Now, we understand this error message, but I have a question for you. How did Python know? How did Python know that we need to pass one argument? And how did it know that that argument should be assigned to the parameter name? The answer is the dunder code attribute. And the most important attribute in a function is indeed dunder code. And its attributes contain the Python bytecode. Remember, remember that Python is a compiled language. And so when we define our function, it is compiled into bytecodes. Those will then be executed. We'll see more of those in a bit. So in addition to the bytecode, Python also writes all sorts of hints to the interpreter about our function. 
And one of those hints is COR count. COR count defines, tells, the, tells Python, how many arguments does the function take? So if I now go to hello and to its dunder code attribute, and then under dunder code, I ask for COR count, it says one. So indeed, when I say, right, when I say here, hello name, hello world, Python says, oh, COR count says that we need one argument. The user passed one argument, and we will assign it then to name. World becomes assigned to name, and all is good. But what if I say hello with no arguments? Python says, oh, wait, COR count requires one argument. We did not pass any. Here we get an error. Yeah, but how did it know that that argument would have been assigned to the variable name, to the parameter name? We still haven't seen that. Well, guess what? There's another attribute that we can be looking at. And that attribute is CO var names. This is a tuple of strings, and it's all of a function's local variables. And the first vocal variables are going to be the parameters. So in this version of our function, we only have one parameter. We have no other local variables. And so when I ask for hello, dunder code, CO var names, what do we see? We see a tuple of one element, name. And so now Python knows that the function requires one argument. That's thanks to CO arg count. And it knows that this argument will be assigned to the parameter name. So far, so good. Moreover, it knows that if we get no arguments to the function, the name is missing a value. OK, sure enough, if I say here, hello, with no arguments, hello is missing one required positional argument name. But if I now define hello of first and last, hello first, last, what happens? Well, COR count has now changed. It now has two because it expects to get two arguments. And now if I say what are COVAR names, sure enough, first and last. We have two local variables. And so the error messages are going to use this information in order to understand what went wrong and tell us so we can understand it. So now if I say hello, Reuven, it says, no, no, no. You're missing one required positional argument. And that would be last. You didn't bring me, you didn't give me any values that would then be assigned to last. What if I, though, don't pass my arguments as positional? Positional arguments meaning that they are assigned based on their positions, based on their locations. But rather, I pass a keyword argument. And keyword arguments look like this. Name equals value. Last equals learner. So now if I say, hello of last equals learner, well, what's wrong? Well, we know that it still needs one more value, but it no longer needs the value for last, it is the value for first, and that's indeed what it knows. It says, aha, you're still missing one required positional argument, and you're missing first. What if I say hello of A and B and C? Well, now the function says, listen, hello takes two positional arguments, but three were given. Not a chance. I don't know what to do here. Stop it already. Well, what if we define a local variable? Remember I said before that the CO var names keeps track of all of our local variables including parameters, but we did not have any before. So what if I define a local variable as well? Let's do that. I'm going to say here def hello first and last, and then I'm going to take the string and I'm going to assign it to s, and then I'm going to return s. So it's exactly what I did before, but I've added an additional step of assigning to a local variable. Now if I say what is COR count, it is still two. COR count is still two because we still expect to get two arguments, but COVAR names, there are now three elements in that tuple, first and last and s. Now, the first COR count elements of CO var names are parameters. What do I mean by that? So COR count is two. CO var names has three elements. The first two elements, first and last, are parameters. S is just a local variable. What's the difference, by the way, between a parameter and a local variable? The difference is basically that a parameter gets its value from the caller. Whoever is calling the function assigns that value, whereas a regular local variable has to get its value inside of the function. Okay. What about splat args? You might have seen this before, and you don't have to use the name args, but it's pretty common to do that. So if I say def hello of first and last and args, splat args, args is going to be a tuple with all of the positional arguments that no one else wanted. So if I say hello of A, B, C, D, E, A goes to first, B goes to last, and C, D, E, all in a tuple is args. Args takes all the positional arguments that no one else wanted. What is the arg count on this function? Oh, the arg count is two. What are the var names? Well, the var names are first, last, and args. And this raises an interesting question. How does Python know? How does Python know that we have splat args in our function? Because it's not listed as an argument. 
right? It doesn't list infinity as the number of potential arguments. It just says our count is two. So there must be something else going on. And indeed, there is. This information, along with some other stuff, is kept in CO flags. CO flags, that's right, yet another attribute on Dunder code. And CO flags is actually an integer. Um, this int is the bitwise end of several bit flags. And if each of these bits is on, it's one, otherwise it's off or zero. Now, I don't know about you, it's been many, many years since I actually dealt with bit flags. Some of you watching this may never have dealt with bit flags. It used to be a very common thing when we had to worry about conserving memory that I could have, well, eight different things, eight different yes, no, true, false values stuffed into one place. And that's exactly what's happened here. So we have in our bit flags, these two are always on, optimize the new locals. But then we have a bunch of other flags. Is args turned on? Is kwargs turned on? Do we have a nested function? Is this a generator? Each of them can be either on or off, and the resulting binary values give us one uh, integer value, which Python can then check. By the way, it is easier to understand this in hex. So optimize the new locals, fine. Those are always in, in, uh, you know, happening now. Var args, right? That's, do we have splat args? Var keywords, do we have key, kw args going on? Do we have nested scopes and is this a generator? And sure enough, if I say hello, dunder code, co flags, and, and here we have bitwise and with hex 04, yeah, sure enough, we see there that this flag is turned on. But do we have double, double splat kw args running here? No, we do not. But what about double splat kw args? What happens in that case? Well, if I say hello, double splat kw args, now this is a silly thing to do, but now any and all of the keyword arguments, only the keyword arguments that no one else wanted, and there are no other parameters here, so there is no one else, all the keyword arguments are going to be put into a dictionary called kw args. By the way, what happens in this function to positional arguments, the ones without the equal sign, without the name equals value? Positional arguments are not legal in this function. If you call hello with just a name, it will give you an error saying, I don't know what to do with this positional argument. And so if I now say hello code, seal flags, and hex four, nope, no splat args. But how about hex eight? Oh yeah, KW args, that's there for sure. There is a really, really cool module that comes with Python in the standard library called dis, dis short for disassembly. And in the dis module, we have the show code function. Show code gives you a nice summary of what's going on in the function. So let's take a look. Hello, it's from a file name in IPython, meaning that I did in Jupyter. How many arguments? Zero. How many keyword-only arguments? Zero. Local value variables? One. Well, that's going to be our KW args. But here we have the flags, and the flags are actually displayed very nicely for us to understand. But then we also have constants. What the heck are constants? I thought Python didn't have constants at all. Well, no, no, no. Python, the language, does not have constants. But there is actually an attribute on your Dunder code attribute called CO consts. The first item in CO const is always going to be none. But other constants like strings and ints, and they all have to be immutable, are also stored there. By the way, if you look at how an F string is created, it's broken up into parts. The stuff before the curly braces and the stuff after the curly braces. The byte codes then refer to constants by index number. So when we sit here, I'm going to go back for a moment to my slides. Oops, 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 oops. Here we go. So you can see, oh, I guess we don't see it here. We don't see the byte codes here. But basically, if you look at the bytecodes for this function, you'll see that's going to load constant one and constant two, and that's hello, and that's exclamation point. When it puts together, it's f string, and we see these here in the constants. Well, what about the bytecodes themselves? Oh, here, I'm going to show it to you now. Sorry, I got mixed up a little bit. So if we just go to look at hello, dunder code, co code, this gives us a byte string. Now, I don't expect you to read byte strings, but dis.dis dot dis will help us. Here's another fantastic function in the dis module. So I run dis dis of hello, and look what we get. This is actually what Python runs. These are the bytecodes that Python is using. So first we're loading a constant, constant one. And we saw before that constant one is the string hello before the uh, curly braces in the F string. We load that fast, load fast kw args. We format the value. We load another constant, uh, exclamation point. And then from all these things, we're gonna build the string. We're gonna build the string from hello, and kw args and the constant. And then what are we going to do with the string that we've created? We're going to return it. That's our return value. 
Now, all this explains our regular parameters. It also explains splat args and double splat kw args, but there are a few other kinds of parameters that you've probably seen. For example, what if I want to have defaults? What if I say def hello name equals world? So we know now that world is the default for name, but how does this work? What's going on? Is the arg count different? And the answer is no. The arg count, if we look at Dunder code, co arg count is still one. So it looks like our function is working just like before, but we know that we can call with no arguments. So, so what's going on? How does this work? And the answer is, Dunder defaults. That's right. That's right. It's another attribute. But this attribute is not on Dunder code. This attribute is stored directly on the function object. So whatever function object you have, it's dot Dunder defaults right there. And what does it look like? Well, if I say what's hello dot Dunder defaults, look at that. It's a tuple containing world, one element because we had one default. Dunder defaults is always a tuple. And if you have no defaults, then it's an empty tuple. That's fine. And so when Python calls a function, it compares the arguments with co arg count. If the number matches, great, pass the arguments and call the function. If they're not enough arguments, then it checks to see if Dunder defaults can close that gap. And if so, it uses enough values from Dunder defaults to get to co arg count. So if I have three uh, um, required arguments, if my function is supposed to have three arguments, and I only pass two, Python says, oh, well, two plus one is three, does very sophisticated mathematics there. And so it takes the one last element from Dunder defaults. Well, what if I pass too many arguments? Well, then it says check CO flags to see if splat args is defined. If so, it finds the remaining arguments to splat args. Or whatever variables named in CO var name, CO arg count. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. So let's try this. Here's a fun function to talk about. I'm going to say here add one of x, x append one. And so I say my list equals 10, 20, 30. And I'm going to call add one on my list. What is the value of my list after I call this function? Well, I call the function with my list. It gets in there and x appends to one, well, x appends one. And that adds to x, but it also adds to my list. Indeed, every single time I call add one on my list, I'm going to be changing my list. And this is an important and hard idea for many people to understand that when I call a function and I pass a value to it, I'm passing the object reference. It is not really called by reference. It's not really called by value. I'm passing the object. If the function wants to change the object, and if the, fun if the object is mutable, then yeah, we can do it. But it has more to do with the object's mutability and less to do with you know, how the function is being run. Well, let's take this function and modify just a, lot, a little bit. I'm going to say def add one, x equals empty list, x append one, return x. Notice here I've added a default. What does this default mean? It means, of course, that if I call a function with an argument, then that argument will be assigned to x, will append one to whatever it is, and will return it. So far, so good. But what if I call the function without an argument? So I say print add one. So we've called the function without an argument. It requires an argument, right? Because arg count is one. So what does Python do? It goes to the defaults and pulls out our list, adds one to that, and we're doing great. And then I call add one again. And what do we get as a result? One, one. And I call it again, and what do I get as a result? One, one, one. And by now you're thinking, uh oh, something terrible is going wrong here. And by the way, something terrible is going wrong here. What the heck is going on? So the mistake that everyone makes is to believe that what we told Python is, if I call add one and I don't pass an argument, then I want a list, an empty list to be passed to X. Makes sense, I understand it. But that's not what really happened. What really happened is we told Python, when we call this function without an argument, this list, the list that we created when we were defining our function, that's what we want to be assigned to X. That list is in Dunder defaults when the function is created. And every time we call the function without an argument, that same list is assigned to x, that same list is modified, that same list is still in Dunder defaults, and the next time around, the Dunder defaults will have that list, but with one, and then one, one, and then one, one, one. By the way, some people have told me, oh, this is amazing, this is a fantastic way to keep values around across different calls to our function. No, it is not, this is a terrible idea. In fact, we often say in Python, never use mutable defaults. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. And in fact, 
If you run pylint on this file, on this program, what do we see? Dangerous default value, empty list as an argument. Don't use mutable defaults. Now, if you're not running pylint on your program, that's okay, mostly, because many, many, many modern uh, Python editors will run either pylint or something close to pylint in the background on your code. So you don't necessarily need to worry about like running pylint, but you should definitely worry about mutable defaults. And if you get warnings of this sort, listen to them, because otherwise you'll end up with really hairy bad behavior. How about keyword only arguments? What does that mean? Well, let's say I say here, hello, splat args, sep equals space. What in the world? Well, I have splat args. I'm going to take as many arguments as I want. But then I have this sep thing coming after splat args. I thought splat args took all of the arguments. Yeah, it takes all the positional arguments. What sep is here is a keyword only argument. You can only set its value if you give it a, you pass it as a keyword argument, only as name equals value. In this case, sep equals a value. So when I call hello of ABC, my first example here, just ABC, it shows me ABC with a separation of a space. Why? Because sep has a default value of space. But if I call ABC sep equals splat, then it'll give me hello, you know, A star, B star, C. Note, you cannot say ABC star. And that's because splat args will take all the positional arguments. Only because it's a keyword argument is sep equals star validated. Well, okay, that's nice that we have keyword only arguments. And they are actually kind of handy in many ways, but where does Python keep track of that? Because our argument in this function was not counted with the others. The COR count, in fact, for this version of hello is zero. Zero because splat args is not counted, and zero because a keyword only argument is not counted. Here we have, see? Keyword only arguments, one. C-O-K-W only argument, it's stored there in a different attribute. So Python is actually checking in many, many, many different places. It checks in C-O-R count for the number of mandatory positional arguments. It checks in under defaults for values that make C-O-R count flexible. And then it's going to check in C-O flags. Do we assign positional arguments? Do we assign keyword arguments? And K-W only count. Now let's talk about scoping a little bit. If I say x equals 100, and then I define my function, in function, you know, in func, x equals, and I'm going to print before x equals this, call func, and after. So the thing is now, what's going to happen? What's going to be printed when I run all this code here? Well, x here, that's 100, right? Well, what's going to happen after that? Well, then I call my function, and x here, x is going to be 100. But how does Python know? Because it has to check. It checks local and closing global built-ins, L-E-G-B. Always, 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 when we're outside of a function, Python first looks in global and then in built-ins. When we're inside of a function, Python checks all four scopes, local and closing, global and built-ins. Always, always, always in that order. So inside the function, we say, is there a local X? No. Is there an enclosing X? No. Is there a global X? Yes, there is. And so we get 100. And then when the function returns, once again, what are we going to get? 100, because we're outside the function, the global is 100. But how does Python know that x is not local? How does it check? Well, it checks in the attributes, of course. It's going to check in co var names and see that we have an empty tuple. Since x is not in co var names, it's not a local variable. Now let's make things more complex. I'm going to say x equals 100, and my function is now going to have x equals 200, see? And so if we do our print and func and print, what's going to happen? Well, x the first one, outside the function, we check in global. Is x global? The answer is yes. It's 100. Then we call our function. Inside of the function, we say x equals 200. So then when we print, what are we going to get? Well, it's going to say, is x local? The answer is yes. And the value is 200. It doesn't even check global. The fact that x is local means that that's all we're going to check. And then when we return, well, once again, it's going to be 100. Once again, how does Python know that x is local? Because it's in co var names. It checks here and it knows. And that means, though, that co var names, like all these attributes, is populated at compile time. It's not populated at runtime. Right? So when your function is defined, that's when co var names is set. So it knows what local variables it has even before you run the function. And that leads me to this next example. What if I say x equals 100? And here's my function. Notice that I swapped these two lines. Previously, I said x equals 200, then print. 
Now I'm saying print an x equals 200. What's going to happen when I run this code? Well, first of all, what's going to happen? Before, x is 100. That's pretty good. And then we're going to get an error. Error? What kind of error is this? It's actually an unbound local error. And we read here, the local variable x was referenced before assignment. Well, wait, 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 what's going on here? So consider this. Before we assign x to the function, before we say x equals 200, x is local. How do we know that? How do we know that x is local? Because when the function was compiled, it wrote down the fact that x is local. And how did it know that x was local? Because we said x equals. In other words, the mere fact that we assigned to x in our function, once you have assignment to x in a function, doesn't matter where it is, x is local. This is known as the hoisting problem sometimes, that does not matter where your variable is defined in the function or assigned to in the function, it's local no matter what. And so when we, and when we run the function, we need x's value for the print. And it, Python knows that x is local, but it also knows it has no local values, and thus we get this unbound local error. Now you might be saying, that's ridiculous. Who would ever get this sort of error? The answer is, of course, everyone. But let me show you a, a common example x equals 100, that's global. And then in my function, I'm going to say here, x plus equals 1. Now, here's the thing. This is the same as saying x equals x plus 1, so you know what's going to happen. It notices x equals at compile time, and thus notes that x is a local variable. Why is it local? Because we're assigning to it in the function. But at runtime, we first say x plus 1. What's the value of x? Oh, let's find out. Is it local? Yes. What's the value? Boom. Doesn't work. So we could get around this by saying global x. And you might be familiar with global x as a statement. And what global says is, don't, when you see that x equals 200 inside the function, when you see an assignment to x in the function, ignore it. Don't make x a local variable. In this function, any x you refer to is still global. And so now it's going to be 100, and then 200, and then 200, because there is no local x. In fact, if we look at the function, if I say func under code co var names, you know what we see? We see that we have an empty tuple there. Python uses legb to look for x. It cannot find x in the tuple, so it assigns the global variable x. And we can even see this in our bytecodes. Normally, with a local x, it's going to say store fast and load fast. Fast means local variable. But with a global x, it says store global and load global. Right? Notice? Isn't aren't bytecodes great? Let's just look at one last example here. Let's put the E in LEGB. I mentioned in closing scopes before, what does that mean? Well, if I have here a nested function, one function side of another, I have outer and inner. Notice that inner is defined when we run outer. And the run counter here is zero, and the total is zero, and those are outside, those are in outer. And then I say run counter plus equals one. So now what's going to happen? and total plus equals x. What's going to happen when I run this code? Func equals outer, so I'm going to get back a function that's going to be inner. And then I'm going to run func. I'm going to run the function I got back, which is inner. But you know what's going to happen as soon as this happens, as soon as I run it? That's right. I'm going to get unbound local error. And that's because inside of the function here, when I had run counter plus equal 1 and total plus equal x, they were just like what I did before just like what I had in the previous function. It doesn't matter it's an inner function. If Python sees assignment to a variable inside of a function, unless it sees some other uh, statement, some other declaration, global or something else, like here, non-local, it will assume that it's a local variable. So here we have to say non-local. The run counter is not local to our function, but it is local to the enclosing function. And run counter also. And this is how you can see it in the Python tutor. It's a little confusing, I admit. But the outer function here, right, that was our outer function, and it sticks around. Our inner function here, it knows. It knows it was defined in an uh, environment where x was equal to 20. So basically, our inner function, when you have an inner function in Python, it knows that it should be using variables from the outer scope. That's the E, the enclosing scope in LEGB. And if we say non-local, then we can assign to those values also and keep them around across different variable calls. How does this work? How does Python keep track of it? Well, if I call outer, and then I say, what are your free vars? It says, oh, run counter in total. 
So that's the inner function. The inner function knows which variables are actually in the enclosing scope. But that's not all, because outer knows which of its local variables are referenced. We say selvar. So you see it's sort of pointing in both directions there. The inner function knows that run counter and total are in the outer function. The outer function knows that run counter and total are going to be used by the inner function. What have we learned? What have we not learned? We have learned a lot. So def does two things. It creates a function object, and it assigns the function object to a variable. Function objects contain attributes, bytecodes, hints to Python, and those attributes are used to dictate behavior that we often take for granted. Argument assignment, scoping, inner functions, and so forth. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this talk. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me, catch me on Twitter, or you can join about 25,000 other people on my free weekly mailing list, Better Developers. I very much look forward to speaking to you in the chat room. Thanks a lot for paying attention, and I look forward to hopefully, hopefully seeing you in person at next year's PyCon APAC. All the best.